Good morning. A uh, warm uh, welcome to this uh, strategic um, outlook Eurasia session at the uh, 2022 World, World Economic Forum annual meeting here in Davos, uh, Switzerland. I'm Eric Dushek. I'm uh, with the forum. Those of you uh, who have uh, been with us um, for some time in person or uh, digitally, you would know that this is a bit of a tradition to have a moment to strategically think about uh, the Eurasia region. And doing so could not be more important uh, this year. We are gathered here um, in person two years after we have not been able to meet in person because of a once in a century pandemic uh, that has inflicted uh, pain, loss of life and economic damage in every corner uh, of this world. We're gathered here, it will be three months tomorrow uh, since the start of uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the ensuing tragic war uh, in Ukraine uh, that is still uh, ongoing. Uh, we are gathered here at a time when the global economy, when it was just about to take off or at least find some pathways to recovery, is hit with different uncertainties, particularly the geopolitical uncertainty and dealing with the cascading effects of this geopolitical uncertainty in terms of particularly uh, the energy systems and the food systems a global economy that is uh, having inflationary pressures we haven't seen in decades, a global economy um, that is seeing a lot of economies' fiscal positions being stretched. Uh, this morning uh, we uh, heard from uh, the IMF head that 60% uh, of the low-income economies of the world have debt vulnerabilities, 60%. Um, and we're also convened at a time when we have this big global fight uh, against climate change. This is the decade we're supposed to deliver on the net zero transition or at least make sure that we accelerate cooperation there, but it is now happening in a more complex international system. So against this backdrop, of course, policymakers are affected and are reacting. Every corner of this world Every company, every country is, uh, is affected, including the Eurasia region. And we're going to be talking both about the impact, but more importantly, we're going to be spending time about or on how we are reacting, what we can do, not only now, but also where decision makers see this is all headed so that ultimately we can also find pathways to increase competitiveness and resilience in the future. So this is a very important conversation, and I have a very important panel uh, to help us uh, navigate this and, uh, and, and uh, unpack this a little bit. So let me uh, introduce my panel. I'd like to welcome um, Madame Odile Françoise uh, Rono Basso, President of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Uh, warm welcome. I'd like to welcome uh, uh, Mikhail Jabarov, Minister of Economy of Azerbaijan. Uh, also, a warm welcome to Kairat Kelimbetov, uh, Governor of the Astana International Financial Center Authority in Kazakhstan. And last but not least, a warm welcome to Dr. Yuan Ding, uh, Vice President and Dean at the China Europe International Business School in Shanghai, China. So with this very complex landscape, I'd like to start um, with you, Madame Renaud Basso, um, EBRD, an extremely important organization uh, for Europe, Eurasia also, Middle East and North Africa. You're a big investor in Eurasia. I saw your um, recent report, I think it was in March or April, that you put out an update on the economic outlook in the context of the war in Ukraine. Um, could you tell us a little more about what is in the report? How do you see the impact on the economies of Eurasia uh, in this current context? Well, thank you very much, and um, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to discuss about uh, the region, the impact of the war, but also the opportunities. I think that's uh, always a way we, we should think 
think about um, our action. So indeed, um, we've updated our uh, economic outlook. And what is very clear, of course, we the impact of the war on Ukraine is very important on Ukraine. It's very important on the neighboring countries, but it also have a huge e effect uh, more broadly, and uh, countries, I mean, Eurasian countries are also deeply affected uh, through different ways, in different ways, depending on, I mean, on the specific features of the economy. And um, overall, our assessment uh, is uh, that we have revised downwards the uh, growth perspective by, my, I mean, reducing them by 1.4%. Um, and I would tend to believe that overall our scenario is quite still maybe on the positive side because mm. we are, it's based on an assumption that the war on Ukraine will stop. I mean, there will be a source of ceasefire or so forth in, um, in the f coming months. Mm. So it's not, I mean, uh, we don't, it's not forecast related to a long, I mean, long war. But um, so the impact of the assessment of the impact for this uh, the region is uh, 1.4, so which would bring a growth in 2023 of around 3.2% uh, and 3.5% uh, on average in 2023. But all this is very, as I was underlying, very uncertain. When we look at the different channel, how the economies are impacted, I think the first impact is uh, through um, food, um, energy, metal price, mm. which has, uh, which fuels in inflation. Infl on average, inflation um, has reached 12% in the region, uh, which is the highest level since 2011, I believe. So it's already there, uh, higher inflation pressure post-COVID in the context of the recovery. But this increase of food, energy, and uh, metal prices has a, will have a significant e effect on, on inflation. Uh, but the countries in the region are also affected by um, the very close link, in some, for some of them, with Russia, mm. um, with impact, for example, on remittances. A uh, uh, number of countries are very highly dependent. And it's the case of Uzbekistan. And are very high, I mean, remittances represent quite a high level of GDP. But also all the trade flows, so direct export or trade flows through Russia to, to uh, Europe. And sanction on Russia has a huge impact on all this um, I mean, export capacity, but also, um, I mean, all the infrastructure for transport and for um, export towards um, Europe. And um, um, last, last effect also, I mean, the third effect is also um, the increase of the cost of financing. Geopolitical uncertainty uh, create um, uh, aversion to risk, and we see that in the region, but also elsewhere. So, I mean, interest rates tend to increase. I think that there is a the yield increase in um, uh, cost of, I mean, has increased by more than 3.3%, so mm -hmm. 3.3%, 3 and this has a particularly significant impact on some countries like Mongolia, Tajikistan, so most fragile countries. Um, so, I mean, the situation is, of course, very, depend, very depend, different. It's difficult to talk of the Eurasian country as a whole, mm -hmm. because, for mm -hmm. example, Kazakhstan, I mean, um, Kazakhstan or Azerbaijan may benefit from um, increase in, um, yes. I mean, will really benefit from increase in, in prices in energy, but others will have um, uh, more damaging impact. So this is w what we see as, a, as, a, as an impact. Of course, this also creates, I mean, and there are some opportunities for investment and shifting the economy and so forth, and maybe we come to that at a later point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, thank you so much. If I could move to Minister Jabarov. Um, I saw the economy contracted minus 4% 2020, of course, COVID rebounded over 5%, I think, 2021. I saw the report from EBRD. So for 2022, I think it was still about five, but of course, I think we need to watch that, but a major, major economy um, in the region. So tell us just to, again, uh, for the lay of the land, how do you see the impact, particularly the economic impact of the of the different things that I've mentioned, the geopolitical uncertainty, but also, of course, COVID uh, and the state of the glo global economy as it is right now? Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, it is honor and pleasure to be uh, at this distinguished uh, audience and uh, forum. Uh, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, convey uh, the uh, best and warmest regards of uh, permanent participant and speaker of the forum, His Excellency President Aliyev, who as we speak, uh, uh, is working uh, with uh, uh, 
President Charles Michel, Prime Minister Pashinyan on delivering long and lasting peace in the region, region uh, torn by separatism for almost last three decades. And uh, that is uh, the reason why he uh, has not been this year uh, at uh, Davos. Uh, uh, indeed, it is absolutely uh, correct that the um, entire region has been uh, affected. It has been affected in uh, different ways. Um, um, and uh, in the case of Azerbaijan, uh, I think the issues which uh, Madam President has alluded to, namely uh, energy, uh, food security, uh, connectivity, uh, are uh, obviously the, and, and of course, the uh, level of digitalization and preparedness of the economy to uh, work under uh, mm -hmm. current uh, circumstances have been the ones which have been defining the uh, landscape and context. It is true that um, when you look at figures, uh, economy of Azerbaijan is performing strongly, both in terms of fiscal, uh, but also uh, in terms of the economic uh, output. Uh, um, but if we look a bit uh, broader, uh, I think the following uh, uh, landscape, the, the way how uh, we see it, uh, is formed as follows. Um, first of all, we see uh, increased importance of uh, regional uh, cooperation with, uh, for obvious reasons, uh, changed um, connectivity uh, landscape, so-called middle uh, uh, corridor. Uh, becomes extremely uh, important for all uh, regional actors, but also for cargo flow from east to west, um, China to Europe, uh, uh, vice uh, versa. And therefore, uh, investments that have been made in previous decades in transport infrastructure, uh, close and reliable uh, cooperation with neighboring uh, countries, mm -hmm. uh, uh, is really an asset that is yielding a dividends today. Uh, of course, energy. Uh, when we talk about energy, uh, um, I think two main dilemmas are what you know what ref uh, would refer to as 525 and issue of what and how. When we talk about what and how, everyone agrees that what needs to be done uh, is um, speedy uh, transition to uh, green and renewable energy. I think the previous years and especially this year has shown all of us, especially here consumers in Europe that on matter of how uh, there needs to be uh, much more uh, discussion and look because when we very simply when uh, region uh, Azerbaijan specifically is being asked for more uh, uh, energy which we have which we are happy to uh, supply uh, to the market uh, but when you look at how you suddenly realize that uh, for the last uh, few years uh, the sector has been severely uh, underinvested reflecting the um, changed policy of um, uh, obviously financial institutions, policy makers relating to uh, fossil fuels, including natural gas. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, therefore, that uh, focus shift uh, uh, in terms of how to translate the needs of today mm -hmm. uh, and to combine them with a necessity of being uh, tomorrow, there is this five year horizon, not 25, not 15 years horizon, but this five year horizon, which is a second part of the uh, dilemma that we need to uh, address, at least the way it seems uh, from us. Uh, uh, and uh, talking about food uh, uh, security, uh, of course, uh, the, uh, on one hand, uh, the obvious uh, challenges and the rising uh, prices, supported also by both rising inflation and uh, shortened uh, supply would impact seem, the, seem uh, that would impact um, those economies which are more vulnerable and unlike again uh, in case of Azerbaijan mm -hmm. which has strong fiscal position very low uh, uh, external uh, debt to GDP uh, uh, level energy uh, inflows uh, many countries do not have that luxury uh, uh, and again when we're talking about a regional uh, uh, impact of it Yes, that, that is something uh, on which we, uh, we believe uh, we need to put more uh, focus working together, which we try uh, to do through uh, regional uh, uh, cooperation. And uh, maybe to um, finish this part uh, of uh, intervention, we uh, strongly uh, believe that uh, the need to combine the uh, challenge of the day with the focus where we are moving uh, uh, together is something on which 
um, regional international institutions, regional uh, uh, institutions, not only on bilateral level, but that level of uh, uh, mm. discussion is extremely uh, useful and uh, we are committed to continue to be safe, stable uh, uh, supplier when it comes to what we supply in terms of goods or services uh, uh, to the uh, uh, markets and at the same time in terms of the uh, policy dialogue participation and uh, overall priority of macroeconomic and strong financial framework. Thank you. Minister, thank you so much. If you allow, I'll just have a follow-up question because you, you are very popular right now, I'm sure, with the European decision makers in particular um, on the energy side. Mm -hmm. um, 2020 was the opening of the, uh, is it the South, uh, Southern Gas Corridor? Uh, and um, 2021, 8.1 billion cubic meters uh, float through that. The capacity, I think, is ultimately 20, based on the research we've done. So overall, how do you see the future particularly of the Azerbaijani European energy flow. If you, if you could maybe give us a little <coughs> more on where you see it, partic with regard to this pipeline, but there may be other things you're looking at. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, first of all, if we look at the map, uh, it is important to keep in mind that before uh, contributing to energy supplies and security in European Union or in Europe, uh, similarly, on the way, Azerbaijan is a major supplier to Georgia, uh, Turkey, mm -hmm. and further on, it is uh, uh, Greece, uh, Bulgaria, Italy, uh, Albania. Uh, so volume is actually much bigger than that, and the volume to which you refer is the volume which is reaches European market. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, second point, uh, uh, to put it very simply, uh, is there more uh, gas uh, to be supplied? Yes, there is. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, are we working on it? Yes, and we didn't start it today, but this was a process which was started well before uh, latest uh, developments. Uh, and uh, I think Renew Europe uh, uh, document dated 18 May, which has been just uh, out, uh, makes a very specific reference to uh, prospects and necessity of uh, uh, expansion of uh, uh, supplies, so-called uh, southern uh, gas uh, uh, corridor. Uh, we are working with uh, our uh, partners, and by way of reminder, uh, from mid-90s, Azerbaijan mm -hmm. carries out a policy of a joint uh, development of its natural energy resources. So we have major, in addition to our national uh, uh, energy, national oil company, we also have a major uh, European partners uh, with us. That effort, by the way, has been uh, supported at time by UBRD uh, uh, as well. Uh, um, and uh, the prospects of Azerbaijani and uh, Caspian gas is very different. Now, there is a very important point which doesn't need to be underlooked, and it is as follows. Azerbaijan uh, in 2012 started the process and was a basically major risk taker uh, for uh, making sure that the there is a significant investment in pipeline, there is a significant investment in exploration and development and production. So financial risk, in a way, was borne by a supplier. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, whether or not, and to what extent, uh, and what is the level of commercial uh, risks that could have been taken now, additional risks, by companies working in Azerbaijan, local or foreign, and how these risks need to be shared and managed, how we need to use the strength of international financial institutions, how uh, uh, you know, necessity to uh, make this transition smoothly mm -hmm. and contribute to energy security. That is exactly the focus of our uh, discussion with colleagues, friends, and uh, partners. Uh, and uh, we are co committed and open to this. No, thank you so much. Um, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to move to um, uh, Mr. Kelimbetov, um, Kazakhstan, um, $170 billion economy. You also returned to growth in 2021, um, uh, the biggest economy in Central Asia. Um, you have the new Kazakhstan agenda. How 
could you tell us a little more about that? Because I think the president talks a lot about that, uh, uh, and you've, you've been rolling out certain things over the spring. And I think it is, of course, in this context of, of these global headwinds. So if you could just also assess a little bit the impact of, the, of this situation on Kazakhstan first. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for these great opportunities to be here. I think it's uh, really interesting to discuss what's going on in, in our part of the world. As my colleagues from Azerbaijan uh, uh, mentioned, that uh, I think that we can divide countries in the region for the exporters and importers mm. of commodities, and we are in, uh, in Kazakhstan in good situation. So uh, just to remind you that Kazakhstan produces uh, 1.8 million barrels per day, uh, and uh, the biggest uh, trade partner of Kazakhstan is the European Union. So it means that uh, when we start to diversify the, our trade, our economy, so it was 20 years ago, I think it was right investment to the infrastructure. And uh, nowadays we have a reserves of uh, fund of for rainy days, uh, which we call national fund, and, uh, uh, and also reserves of central bank is, uh, is more than 85 billion US dollars. So which is a good, uh, I think, uh, let's say, resource for whatever problems uh, which we, we can have uh, in the different circumstances. By the way, like when it was like COVID time in 2020, 2021, I think Kazakhstan shows a very good uh, response to COVID. So we vaccinated uh, the more than 70 percentage of the adult population. So I think the situation with, uh, um, let's say, with this pandemic, uh, 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 pandemic uh, issues have been resolved very well in Kazakhstan, which has allowed us actually to uh, to get the uh, re, um, to reshape our economy. And we actually, through the V-shape form, the economic recovery last year was about four percentage, mm -hmm. and this year we expect that it also would be more than two percentage. So it's uh, mm -hmm. the most, uh, let's say, pessimistic scenario is not less than less than two percentage. I think it uh, shows resilience of the Kazakhstan economy. In fact, uh, in uh, our CIS regions, so I think that this year Kazakhstan would be the largest in terms of the GDP per capita. So it's a good result from one side in model of economic growth, focus on uh, commodities, on uh, diversifying our roots. So, so we do have, uh, uh, from one side, uh, opportunities to export through, uh, let's say, uh, through Russia. But uh, as my colleague from Azerbaijan mentioned, I think that now we, we Countries in the region want to strengthen the capacity, so-called middle corridor, uh, which is just to remind you from the border of Kazakhstan with China to through Kazakhstan, seaport Taktau, and further uh, uh, Baku uh, and Georgia and uh, and Turkey mm -hmm. and Eastern Europe, let's say. Mm -hmm. So this, I think, is a great opportunities, but not only. So we were also thinking uh, about opportunities to get access through. China to East Asia or through Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan to South Asia. So it's a different opportunities. Now, I think the key lesson which we should conclude from the, the current situation, no one wants to depend from just one country or one sources or mm -hmm. one industry. So that's something which we have to diversify. And I think Kazakhstan is doing a great job in terms of the, let's say, the export route, but also in terms of the FDI coming to Kazakhstan. So it's a different uh, countries, uh, it's uh, China, US, uh, UK, and uh, I think that uh, we will focus on this. From the other side, I think uh, we do understand that uh, in the in era of decarbonization, we should start to think about how to be diversified on the influence just from the oil and gas or any other commodities. So we should focus on the other subsectors of our economy. So one of these is a key, uh, is obvious, is a uh, uh, development of agro-industrial sector, agriculture. It's mm -hmm. a huge opportunity, especially we now see is a huge problem for the supply chain in terms of the, let's say, export of grain from our region. So we do understand there will be some problems due to the conflict uh, in Ukraine. And uh, I think that Kazakhstan being in, in top five uh, exporter of grain uh, also will play like a significant role and we can be a reliable partner to the global community in terms of the uh, let's say, supplier of these uh, very important uh, products. So uh, I think that uh, with, uh, having this kind of the fiscal prudence in Kazakhstan, uh, we, we now focus on further reforms. And we, as you mentioned, the President Tokai focus on uh, uh, constitutional, political and economic mm -hmm. reforms. So mm -hmm. in fact, uh, in a couple of weeks, we will have a referendum in Kazakhstan, which is mm -hmm. a uh, 
political reforms towards uh, democratization, towards uh, decentralization, uh, increasing the role of parliament. And I think this is uh, also very much important in a, uh, let's say, circumstances which we do have uh, usually the power try to strengthen in, let's say, the leverage. But now I think we see that the Kazakhstan focus more inclusive model of economic growth when the people should not just get money from the redistribution of the oil wealth, but they should focus on creating of job places, they should be part of this growth. So this is something which is uh, President Tokai focusing on, and I think that these are uh, uh, three forms which we call New Kazakhstan, New Economic Policy, uh, would be uh, something which make Kazakhstan even more resilient. Mm -hmm. No, Governor, thank you. Um Obviously, there is a lot of, of course, people follow the, the reforms after also the, the, the January um, events. And uh, so uh, uh, th this is of extreme importance to your country uh, and to the region overall. If I could just follow up on the energy uh, side, uh, I think for some time, uh, Novorossiysk was, there were some uh, closures and, and uh, that's, I think, the main route for, for um, Kazakh um, energy uh, to uh, the world. Um, you've mentioned a few projects. Are these uh, projects that have been there before or, uh, and is it more about accelerating work there or are you also thinking about in this immediate context, let's say over the past few months, are you also thinking about other new things to add, to diversify uh, the picture there? Yeah. I think that uh, let's, what you mentioned is that 80% of Kazakh export is going through Russian territory to the yes. uh, seaport on Black Sea, which is called Novorossiysk. So I think it was like some technical problem in March, April, which we fixed. Mm -hmm. Now we come back to the 100% of capacity and I don't see any kind of problems in the future because it's a Caspian Pipeline Consortium where we do have the interest of all companies which are working in Kazakhstan, including American mm -hmm. uh, and Russian companies as well. Uh, from the other side, uh, we don't see also the, uh, any kind of the, uh, risk in terms of the sanctions because after the Crimea events, I think that we clarify that this is like a Kazakh oil going through the CPC. Mm -hmm. So we got the license from U.S. Treasury and I think that everyone realized that. So this is very important to provide, uh, uh, let's say, enough oil for the global markets and the Kazakhstan wants to be also reliable partners in this mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So this is like a for today uh, story, but uh, uh, we, we do have a plan as well to increase the production of oil and gas in Kazakhstan mm -hmm. uh, significantly, and we do have a significant investment previously, and we do have a significant presence of the global oil and gas major companies, uh, American, uh, Chinese, uh, Europeans. And uh, I think that we have to increase the capacity for export in Kazakhstan. So one of the already prepared great opportunities is, uh, uh, again, uh, so-called middle corridor. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I'm talking about that probably we, we have an idea to increase the capacity of seaports from the eastern coast of the Caspian Sea. So the Azerbaijan is, has a great capacity where we can, if we will join it to, mm -hmm. we can, uh, we can start to think about even the, uh, this, uh, let's say, in, uh, increasing the uh, volume of Kazakh oil in a Bakut Belisi Jihan oil pipeline, or, mm -hmm. or to do something more in this direction from one side. In another direction, I think that we have oil and gas pipeline from the west of Kazakhstan to the west of China. And I think that we also mm -hmm. can think about uh, as well. So these are different ideas that we, we have this capacity, but from the other side, we are thinking that we should diversify our economy, so maybe we will develop uh, more of the petrochemical industry, we will more focus on the gas-based station, let's say move from the coal-based station to the gas-based station. We do have a very ambitious plan of decarbonization to be uh, carbon neutral up to the 2060. Mm -hmm. In fact, that even uh, until now, the EBRD is the biggest investor to, to uh, to Kazakhstan, so I think that we have a bigger plan for in terms of the decarbonization with the BRD. So many plans, uh, and uh, I do believe that that uh, can uh, kind of create a real en a global energy hub in our mm -hmm. part of the world when Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan will provide its uh, oil and gas to the rest of the world. Thank you so much. I'd like to move to uh, Professor Ding. Uh, you know, um, I mean, you work mm. for a business school that is the embodiment of mm. uh, European-Chinese relations, economic relations. You know uh, Europe and China very well. Um, 
you could argue that uh, the competitiveness of Eurasia or Central Asia is really dependent also on healthy volumes or increasing volumes of trade between Europe uh, and China, and of course also connectivity in Central Asia and, and, and South Caucasus as well. But so given the global context now, Professor, how do you see this working? Are you pessimistic or, or do you remain somewhat optimistic that we can make this work going forward? Yeah, so thank you for your question. I think we need to take a more historical and a holistic uh, view about this uh, important issue. So the, the discussion in Davos or in other spheres talking about this uh, Euro-Asia integration uh, is related to several very important uh, uh, elements which uh, happened during the past uh, uh, two or three decades. One, of course, it was the open up of China. Then China became a powerhouse, uh, a, a great uh, trade nation, and with a huge support and uh, uh, engagement from, from Europe to, to take China into the international community with the U.S. And in Europe, of course, the big driver was Germany. And on the other side, we also saw the end of the Soviet Union and uh, the independence of uh, various countries uh, from uh, Eastern Europe to the Central Asia. And when we saw more and more uh, economic integration between China and Europe, then it came the idea about this whole continent level uh, regional integration. And of course, it was uh, strengthened by uh, the initiative taken by China called One Belt One Road Initiative uh, from 2013. We were a little bit in a rosy time and the billions of uh, dollars were invested into this initiative from uh, China, from uh, different uh, cities of China building so-called uh, the Continental Bridge, so with the, the railway. Uh, uh, and we also saw along the road uh, in different uh, uh, Central Asian countries, Eastern European countries, we started to smooth up this uh, kind of connectivity uh, till uh, Germany, uh, even to London, right? So there's also the connection directly to UK. But uh, the but is that we are now in a very different uh, uh, geopolitical and economic uh, landscape. On one side, we saw there's uh, more and more reluctance uh, about from especially from Europe to accept fully China as a partner and there is a rephrased uh, before the pandemic uh, talking China on some issues about a competitor which is uh, legitimate so and also more recently we saw there more and more resistance uh, from the German uh, government and the German corporates to taking yeah. China as the privileged partner uh, continuously uh, supporting the, the trade uh, investment relationship between these two countries. So if there is a, a decline or a, a slowdown of the integration between uh, EU and China, and which was uh, illustrated last year by the suspension of the uh, comprehensive agreement on investment, the validation, so which shows that, that we are in a not a ideal situation. And another big problem my colleagues just mentioned about the, the difficulty uh, of this uh, war in Ukraine and the disruption on the, uh, uh, on the uh, supply chain uh, designed uh, between these two, two ends, uh, between China and, and Europe. So what I see in the future is that it will be extremely difficult to go back to the old setting, which means a promo uh, promotion of common prosperity along the road, around the Silk Road, to get all the countries involved. However, for these countries in the middle, like uh, uh, Central Asia, even the Eastern European countries, it's not necessary to be a bad time, in the sense that uh, all the big powers, including, of course, China, EU, and the U.S., were focusing more from their own uh, geopolitical importance, the engagement with uh, these countries, which means there is some uh, economic, political support for more engagement with these countries, and also there are a lot of 
a concrete economic benefit. We talk about uh, uh, substitution of this uh, 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 grain and oil from Russia or Ukraine by these countries. And of course, that will be uh, a huge incentive for Euro European countries. Uh, we, we see from my colleagues' talk, and also from China, because you all know that there is a risk of secondary sanction against Chinese uh, companies, of course, mainly uh, SOEs, about their involvement with Russia. So uh, it's, it is also Chinese interest to diversify their supply, especially with uh, Kazakhstan, which is uh, the neighbor, and they already start some very solid connections for the gas and oil uh, facilities. Mm -hmm. And also a, a country we touch upon a little bit, uh, uh, Uzbekistan, which is uh, now fully accepted by the international community for the trade. They had some labor issues in the past, which can be a huge hub in the international tex textile business. As you know, they are the, the major cotton producer. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if you combine all that, uh, uh, I think we can see a rosy future for this country independent, not necessarily playing the role for the huge volume of trade through their land like a corridor, but mainly as a major economic partner. Uh, of course, since you have more great power talking to you and you have a better leverage also to get a better term for your national development. So I just stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. We have 10 minutes left, so I'll do another round. Um, uh, we will move from the risks to the opportunities. Um, um, uh, Madame Renaud Basso, um, you, you work uh, on many axes uh, uh, in the region, uh, but I'll be particularly interested uh, on, uh, I know you work a lot on the green agenda and also on connectivity, but if you can um, just uh, give us your insights there. No, thank you. Listening, uh, a lot have been said already, and listening to um, to co-panelists, I, I, I was thinking that from our perspective as a building, and we are indeed big investors in the region. I think in uh, two countries we are the first one in terms of uh, investment from MDB. Um, I would say there are four areas of I mean where we focus investment, and we think we should um, do more. First one is infrastructure, and there were some mm. mention on the uh, middle corridor, but I think there is a lot of that can be done to strengthen the port capacity at Acto, Baku, road, railway, pipelines possibly. I think that the southern corridor, there is, a, as it was mentioned, capacity to upgrade, to increase the capacity, and I guess this would, should be part of uh, And there are some studies being on the production side and consumer side uh, to be sure that mm. this fits. But I think that um, there is a lot of opportunity there. But also private sector investment, for example, for manufacturing containers. There, is, there are needs in order to rebuild all these trading um, uh, flows and infrastructure. Uh, second opportunity is the region can be helpful and can play a very positive role in dealing with food crisis. Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan are net exporters of food and um, anything that, and we will focus on anything that we can do to step up production, export and so forth to deal with the current mm -hmm. challenge. Third area, and the one you mentioned, is the green agenda. Mm -hmm. I think the region is, because the countries had the huge, I mean, important uh, natural resources in fossil fuel and so forth, um, they start from a level of green uh, energy relatively low, so there is a lot of capacity to, to step up, and we are working very closely with Azerbaijan, with Uzbekistan, with Kazakhstan on what, what is the strategy, how to move from the current situation to increase renewable, to um, develop long-term strategies, to develop framework. For example, we are working with Azerbaijan on a, an auction uh, framework being implemented now to get private sector investment to uh, develop uh, renewable. I think this is important for the, because of the importance mm -hmm. of the green mm -hmm. agenda and also for the diversification of the countries um, moving forward. So we are in a very specific time where I mean, energy security now is at the core of the, of the, um, uh, of the concern, but developing renewable um, and developing, for example, the grid that is needed to be able to have more renewable 
are also very important for the long-term energy security agenda. So I think this is something we are working with all the countries in which we intervene. Our objective for the bank is to have 50% of our financing in the green sector. Mm. We reached that objective last year. So to do that, we need to really tilt all our investment um, in that um, in that sector. That doesn't mean, for example, we we were big financiers of the Southern uh, Corridor, mm. TAP, TANAP, TAP. Mm -hmm. This doesn't mean that this is excluded, but we need to show if we were to invest now um, in this kind of project, increasing the capacity, that is consistent with the Paris Agreement, the objective of the Paris Agreement. So because this is now a key Enable, enabling condition for us. Everything we do has to be consistent with um, the Paris Agreement. And last point, which is also very important, is that this country can be very, I mean, can play a very important role in the ongoing reorganization of the supply chain. I mm. think that, the sh I mean, sanction on Russia has an impact on uh, supply chain. This, I mean, development also in China, the need to diversify and so forth. And it was been the capacity, for example, for Uzbekistan to develop textile, but a lot of, I mean, there is a lot of potential for that. What is very important, and I'm very happy of what was said about the reform agenda in Kazakhstan and so forth, is to have, to continue with the reforms, mm. um, attract, be attractive for private sector, rule of law, transparency, and so forth. This, are, this is an important agenda for all countries in the region. They are in implementing it, but I think continuing reform is, is, will be important to get out of the, of the situation and have a strong rebound um, and, and take the opportunities that are there despite the overall uh, headwinds. Thank you so much, Madam President. We have about two minutes each for, uh, for the remainder. So, uh, Minister Jabarov, um, on the opportunities, uh, if you could, I know you have big plans on uh, renewables. I think we're quite interesting to hear. Also digital, we, we work with you on the fourth industrial revolution. And I'm also just interested because you mentioned the talks in Brussels. Um, and of course, then if there is then peace, what that means for connectivity of Azerbaijan. All in two minutes, <laughs> if Bill. you can. Uh, <coughs> renewables. Uh, Madam President already talked about it, just to give um, um, two highlights. One, renewable energy uh, of Azerbaijan, including Azerbaijani sector of the Caspian Sea, in terms of energy production, uh, uh, exceeds the uh, uh, fossil fuel uh, energy production in Azerbaijan, mainly made up of the uh, wind uh, power. Mm -hmm. uh, as we speak, a number of the projects have started for implementation. EBRD is financing two of them. We are very thankful, but this is just a small uh, uh, piece of the uh, iceberg. Second element of the renewables is that we are very well aware that uh, um, uh, in the longer term, uh, fossil fuel uh, demand and going out of the market would be very clearly linked to the quote-unquote greenness uh, 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 of the fossil fuel produced. So with that in mind, uh, uh, we see very bright future, both for renewables, but also for uh, uh, traditional fossil uh, fuel uh, energy. Uh, uh, digitalization, uh, we actually hold in very high regard the level of cooperation we have with the forum, once again. Likewise. We think it's uh, extremely uh, important, not only from the point of view what is happening uh, today in terms of the uh, uh, sectoral and policy development, but first and most importantly from the impact that it has on human capital development, uh, which is definitely the uh, uh, most uh, sustainable uh, way of uh, investing into the future. Um, you asked uh, about connectivity and impact um, uh, of uh, uh, Peace Treaty uh, and the implementation of uh, uh, Zengizor Corridor uh, project to uh, link uh, Azerbaijan via Armenia to Nakhchiva and further on uh, to Turkey. Uh, now in a nutshell, uh, this means several things. Uh, first um, is a further increase of reliability of what we call a, a middle corridor. Second, uh, uh, mutually beneficial regional cooperation between countries of uh, South uh, Caucasus and uh, restoring of the uh, peace stability uh, and uh, neighborhood. And that's why Azerbaijan has been uh, a vocal uh, on uh, peace treaty uh, being uh, signed uh, as, as soon as it is uh, practically possible. Um, and 
that is it. Last uh, point, which was not in your questions, uh, but 15 seconds, uh, is a uh, uh, <clears throat> priority for us uh, continued uh, reforms of SOE, state-owned enterprises, mm -hmm. uh, and quietly, uh, without any further allowed, the further development of the uh, private sector, which is already is accounting for more than 80, 80 percent of tax revenues uh, in Azerbaijan, which uh, in effect is a derivative of the uh, reform uh, policies that have been carried out in uh, the economy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Minister. Governor, if I could go to you, um, I looked it up. Uh, you had at your um, authority 50 companies when you started in 2018. Now you have almost uh, 1,300. Um, so great growth there. Um, what are you doing to then grow that number even further, again, uh, looking, I know you've been uh, working with green bonds, but we'll, we also work together on the fourth industrial revolution. So, again, in two minutes, if you can give us an yeah, overview. Yeah, I think just to remind that Astana International Financial Center is uh, one, uh, the first and yet only the common law jurisdiction in the former Soviet Union area. So this is what we create for the better investment climate. So first it's dispute resolution authorities where we invited uh, retired British judges and it's good for the uh, invest, global investors to Kazakhstan to get uh, resolving of any issues we have between each other or with the government from one side. From the other side is also the continued uh, processes of privatization in Kazakhstan. So in our stock exchange where we jointly with uh, our partners uh, are preparing to the listing of the national oil and gas company. Gas company previously was a national uranium company, which uh, Kazakhstan Prom. And you do understand that the role of Kazakhstani uranium, uh, raw material uranium, is now uh, huge in terms of the plan yeah. of uh, decarbonization and uh, nuclear power among temporary green, let's say. And I do believe that till 2045, the Kazakhstan Prom will play significant role. I think the most important for us is like not just like exponential growth of the companies which are registered, but really achieve financial connectivity. So here we, I think, we are very well connecting to the Western community. But from the other side, we now built a very good bridge with uh, uh, Chinese financial institutions such as Shanghai Stock Exchange, such as uh, mm. um, um, such as uh, China Development Bank, People's Bank of China, maybe to open the offshore clearing center to maybe to work in a, in this currency in in the region. So these are some great opportunities to in, in increase the investment uh, to the region. From, from the other side, we will continue to work with our. Uh, uh, let's say, global stakeholder, Citibank, Nasdaq, uh, Goldman Sachs, so with the idea also to bring as more investors as possible. And I think that we have seen the resilience uh, during this uh, few months, this year, during the COVID time, so last 30 years. So and I do believe we will continue this uh, relationship and cooperation. Great. Thank you, Governor. <laughs> Last but not least, uh, Professor Ding, um, you know Eurasia very well. So also just on the opportunity, you already were talking about the opportunities, but if you can just be a little may maybe concrete, where do you yeah. see it on the connectivity or on the green? And particularly, also the governor mentioned now some of the plans with China. What do you think are these opportunities for China uh, on the connectivity front or green front in Eurasia? So as the, the leading business school uh, in, in China, but also in Asia, we, we are very uh, willing to be part of this uh, uh, regional development. So I, from our side, we see clearly we can help uh, and uh, contribute a lot to that uh, development. On, f on the first front, I think the uh, uh, minister mentioned about the human capital and uh, we will be extremely happy to work with uh, different uh, countries, authority and companies in the region to bring you some uh, world-class uh, management trainings and uh, short programs or long programs. Mm -hmm. We'll be very happy to be partner on that. And we have 100 full-time faculties uh, based in Shanghai, Beijing. So it's very easy to come to the region. On the other side, since we are mainly working on executive education, so we have under our arm the largest uh, group of Chinese uh, alumni, more than uh, 26,000. So many of them actually working are the business uh, decision makers, owners on this uh, uh, green energy, textile, uh, energy uh, business, uh, finance uh, industry. So we were really fine-tuned, uh, create some 
uh, business exchange opportunities and bring some of these people into your place or bring your, your people to, China, to Shanghai, to Shenzhen, and really to discuss all these uh, business uh, opportunities. I, I, I'm sure that it's, it's important that the government or government organization set the stage. Actually, the actors, they must be the, the business people. And we are very confident that we'll be able to, to help you to, to create this kind of uh, networking uh, sphere on these particular uh, topics and industry. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you so much, all of you. Uh, it's clear that uh, Eurasia is uh, uh, at a pivotal time. The world is at a pivotal time. And I think this was extremely useful, uh, not only to the people here, but also, as you know, this was a live stream session. So there are people watching this digitally just to help them understand what's happening and make the right decisions around Eurasia going forward. So thanks so much. Thank you. All the best. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you for moderation.